Facebook, good morning here. Getting Instagram going. All right, we are live, y'all. Good morning. My name is Dustin Jones, and you are listening to the PT on Ice Daily Show, brought to you by the Institute of Clinical Excellence. We're live on Instagram. We're live on Facebook. Podcast li listeners, good morning. It's good to see you. Today, we're talking about perception drives behavior, older adults, and progressive resistance training. Perception drives behavior. It's Wednesday. That means it is Jerry on Ice, where we talk about all things older adults. It's also hump day, right? Many of you all just received that email or will receive in about 30 minutes from the current CEO of ICE, Jeff Moore. Awesome, awesome email that's sent out every single week with some jam-packed articles, uh, social media posts, podcasts, whatever is relevant to, to your practice. That is about to go out, so I highly encourage you uh, to check that out. We also, at the bottom of that email, have a ton of links of some upcoming courses. So this is a time of year where where all the ICE faculty, we kind of ramp it down a little bit. Uh, we mend the nets, if you will, and look at our courses and make any updates if we need to as we're going to hit the road pretty hard in 2021. So at the beginning of 20, or sorry, 2022, in January, almost all of our online courses are going to be starting in cohort. And then the live courses are going to be ramping up uh, tremendously. We've got a crazy year ahead. Uh, you can find links to all those upcoming courses on the HDH email. So that's really helpful uh, to make sure you don't miss when we're in your neck of the woods or when that next online cohort is going to be starting. So, all right, what we're going to be talking about today, perception drives behavior, older adults, and progressive resistance training. One thing that's become very evident to me and maybe you as well, uh, when you're starting to work with individuals, is that your perception doesn't always match reality, right? How you perceive uh, situations, how you may think someone perceives a situation isn't always true. And I think this is a very, uh, a very important thing that we need to be aware of, especially as we continue to promote a fitness forward mindset that many of you all are practicing the things that we preach, you're exercising daily, uh, many of you all are lifting barbells, doing clean and jerks and snatches and all this fun, sexy stuff, doing really hard things, getting super fit. That's awesome. But the deeper you go into that world, the deeper uh, exercise becomes a part of your life, the more challenging it can be to connect with those where that is not a big part of their life. And the deeper you go down the exercise rabbit hole, the harder it can be to remember what it's like to be new to something. Uh, to not exercise, what it was like when you first picked up that barbell or that kettlebell or dumbbell or whatever it may be. <clears throat> and so you develop this almost like curse of knowledge and curse of experience that makes it very challenging to relate to someone else that this is relatively new. And that can be very, very difficult and can bring many issues, especially when you are also in a role of a clinician that is, is literally guiding someone through the path of health and for many folks, especially when we're talking about older adults, that is going to include progressive resistance training. And for many, that's going to be the first time that they may have done it. And if you are not able to understand that person, perceive what, how they may uh, think about situations, the potential fear on board, you're going to have a really difficult, difficult time. And so this article, I think, is very helpful for, for many folks. Uh, but definitely, if, if you are new to geriatrics, new to the profession, this is very helpful to understand how people may perceive progressive resistance training. This, this drug that we promote very heavily uh, on, on the ICE platform and definitely uh, in modern management of the older adult. So this article, uh, perception, or sorry, the, the article in, in summary was basically a, a bunch of face-to-face -face interviews. This was released in November of 2021. And these were folks, these were older adults that were considered frail that were in an inpatient rehab uh, facility. So frail older adult, inpatient rehab facility, face-to-face -face interview, asking them about their perceptions of progressive resistance training, what do, are their motivators to participate in resistance training, but then also their uh, barriers. So perceptions, their motivations, and their barriers to progressive resistance training. Inpatient 
frail older adults, all right? So that you can think of kind of who we're working with here. Many of you all are seeing these individuals. What are their perceptions? Some interesting themes. I'm just going to read them to you here. Uh, I'll post the link on the Facebook video as well to this article. So many of these folks, they perceive progressive resistance training to be challenging, rewarding, and enjoyable. Interesting, huh? Challenging, of course. That's, that's obvious. But they perceived it to be rewarding and enjoyable. I found that um, not somewhat surprising in terms of finding it enjoyable. I enjoy it for sure. Uh, but for someone that is considered frail, uh, a frail older adult, an inpatient facility, that's something I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, perceive. So kudos to the, the clinicians in that particular inpatient rehab hospital that did make progressive resistance training enjoyable. So this is what they reported. It was, it was challenging, yet rewarding and enjoyable. They spoke to positive outcomes as a major motivator. So positive outcomes as a major motivator. That when they're able to see progress relatively quickly, uh, it motivated them to continue to pursue progressive resistance training. Uh, many of you all have, have experienced this, right? Whenever you started resistance training, you saw a big increase, improvement in your lifts or whatever measure it may be. And progress can be addicting uh, for sure. And so these folks experience this as well. They also perceive that supervision is necessary, that they needed supervision to perform these activities. And this is where I think we've really dropped the ball as a profession. Uh, and not just PTs, uh, we could say this for rehab in general, even the fitness profession, is that we have complicated exercise and resistance training to the point where people feel like they need to be supervised. That if they move a certain way, they're gonna get hurt. They're gonna hurt that knee or hurt their back or break a bone or whatever it may be, pull a muscle. That there's a lot of associated fear that requires supervision. And that's a shame because this is a potent drug that almost anyone on the face of this earth can benefit from. Yet we've overcomplicated and surrounded by a bunch of fear and nocebos to where people perceive that they need supervision. Now, hear me out. Yes, there are some folks that need supervision, but we don't want that to be the baseline for a lot of individuals, especially frail older adults. So that was kind of tough to read, but not surprising as well. Supervision is necessary. And then they also report that barriers, Barriers to progressive resistance training for them was low self-efficacy, kind of going back to they felt like they needed supervision, right? Low self-efficacy, if we were to define that set of beliefs, we hold about our ability to complete a particular task. They did not believe they could complete something like progressive resistance training for many reasons, right? But for a lot of people, they, they like that confidence. They feel they need supervision so they don't screw things up. Uh, they also... Uh, a barrier for them is the negative effects of progressive resistance training. Something like delayed onset muscle soreness, something like the associated fatigue that may be afterwards, or pain if they've had that particular experience or they perceive pain. So those were their perceptions. Some surprises in there. Uh, overall, relatively positive perception of progressive resistance training. It's rewarding and enjoyable. Uh, they like the positive outcomes, the changes that they see over time, very motivating, but th they felt like they needed supervision. It was too complicated. They needed some professional help, uh, which some of you all think, yeah, that's awesome. That means we're going to have our job, and I think that's terrible. We need to make this so simple that anybody will be confident in approaching some type of resistance. And then they also found those barriers, low self-efficacy and the negative effects of progressive resistance training. So those were their perceptions. Think about your patients and who you've interacted with. You can probably echo the same thing, right? Those are things that you've probably touched on, had conversations uh, with individuals. And, and so those are, are, are some pretty consistent patterns, I would say, especially with many of the people that I've worked with. Now, what do we do? What are the, the big takeaways that I think we need to think about based on this qualitative study and people's perceptions of progressive resistance training? I think the first one is people know this is good for them, right? At this point in uh, human history and, and with our ability to disseminate information, a lot of individuals will know that resistance training is good for them. However, it is our job to show them. It's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough to educate people. We have to show them that resistance training is helpful. And this is where we get to that concept of building the bike. If you've been to any Institute of Clinical Excellence 
course, you have probably walked through some iteration of the process lecture where we talk about the examination process and things that we think about, how we want to interact with individuals, how we want to use that, those first uh, couple interactions to really inform where we go forward. And in that, especially in that initial interaction, but ultimately going forward as well, we want to build the bike. We won't go into detail for this podcast because there's lots of really good PT on Ice episodes that go through this in very good detail. But when you hear build the bike, I want you to think about how you can clearly portray your value to your patient. Is it clear that you are able to help them achieve their particular goal? And I think we have a huge opportunity in progressive resistance training to build the bike and show people that this is good for them, not just talk about it and not just educate. What can be very helpful here, especially if you're working with, let's say this cohort, a frail older adult in an inpatient rehab setting, you do your eval and you probably have some outcome measures that you are expected to take uh, to record. Think about what outcome measures may be very, very sensitive to change in a relatively short period of time, right? You probably have a whole host that you typically do with your individuals, but when we're talking about showing people that we are going to be able to help them and resistance training is going to be able to help them, what ones are gonna be sensitive to change? And it may be different for each patient, right? But some that come off the top of my head that are very sensitive to change, especially related to strength, something like a 30 second sit to stand test or even a 60 second sit to stand test. Up and down, as many times as they're able to, get, to go uh, for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You can test that day one, get people moving, introduce progressive resistance training, and within a matter of, you could retest that, that bad boy in a week with some individuals, and you're going to see some relatively significant change. Clinically significant, maybe not, but it may change their perceptions and show them that this is helpful which they've already said is a motivating factor for them. So think about that. What ones, what outcome measures, that sit to stand, that's one example, right? From the endurance side, the two minute walk test or two minute step test is a great one as well. It's very easy to get change in that particular outcome measure. It may not be clinically significant, but I don't really care at that point. It's more about selling them on the idea that doing this relatively hard thing is going to be very good for them. I'm showing them progress. I'm not just talking about it. All right, how can we show them? How can we build the bike? Two, introduction is vital. Considering when fear is on board and low self-efficacy, how we introduce these interventions is absolutely huge. Let's say you're working with Betty, 87-year-old, older adult, frail, a lot of fear on board, probably haven't exercised much. You look at her and you think, Betty, you're ambulating independently, doing really well, I know in my mind that you have the capacity to deadlift this 26 pound kettlebell that's in my trunk if you're a home clinician. However, Betty may not perceive that. Betty may perceive that she can only lift five pounds or she had a cardiologist restriction 25 years ago that said she shouldn't be lifting more than 15 pounds, right? So Betty does not perceive that she can lift that 26 pound kettlebell, but you know she can't. If we're going to be introducing exercise, you don't want to start with your perception of what they're capable of doing, but what, what do they perceive they're capable of doing? And so introduction is going to be huge. We want to try and get successes early to build that confidence, to build that self-efficacy that's going to allow us to really push them and progress them down the road. So introduction is huge. So this is where we may intentionally underdose in the beginning with these individuals. We talk about dosage a lot on this podcast, but there are a lot of situations and scenarios where we want to intentionally underdose individuals to create this good experience, this successful experience that is going to be limited, that, that's going to limit the negative repercussions of resistance training like delayed onset muscle soreness or maybe potentially fatigue down the road. It makes something intimidating uh, a, a little a little more reasonable for individuals. And this is where, when we go back to the beginning, we think about you, the fitness for a clinician that lives and breathes this type of stuff. It's very hard for you to remember what it was like when you didn't exercise. And if, you put, if you're able to put yourself back in that position, under dosage is a really great way to get into this. Intentional underdosage. Now, when I say intentional underdosage, we're introducing, we're creating a good experience, we're getting them moving, getting them familiar with these implements and these activities 
but we're not staying there, right? We're not going to hang out there for long. We are going to progress. Uh, but if we start at that underdose, intentional underdosage, build their confidence and self-efficacy, we can often progress them a little quicker down the road. And this is where we have to really understand people's perceptions because their perceptions are going to drive their behavior. And if you're able to influence their perceptions be, by being very calculated with showing them progress, by uh, introducing activities that are not going to be too intimidating, that's going to limit delayed onset muscle soreness, limit fatigue afterwards or pain, and potentially intentionally underdose, you're going to set someone up for success to be able to do this progressive resistance training for the long haul and not just for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, however long you're able to see them. So let me know your thoughts, y'all. I'd love to get your thoughts on how you, you introduce progressive resistance training, how you influence people's perceptions. I think there's a lot we can do here. And I would challenge you all, the, the fitness forward clinician that lives and breathes uh, this stuff, you need to work extra hard to be able to connect with individuals where this is not a part of their life. This is very new to them, especially some of these older adults that have never done exercise or resistance training in their lives. You need to be able to connect with them and understand them. And that will not come uh, naturally to many of you. And you have to work extra hard to do that. So let me know your thoughts. I'm going to post the link to this article on uh, the Facebook video. Uh, but we would love uh, to hear any recommendations, critiques, whatever, whether it's Facebook or Instagram, we'd love to, to get that dialogue going. You all have a lovely Wednesday. Uh, check that Hump Day Hustle email. If you did not get that, go to ptonice.com and there's a Hump Day Hustle tab so you can check that out. Otherwise, you all have a lovely day and we'll talk to you soon. See ya. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.